On this episode of Mighty Car Mods, it's all about things that go suck, squish, slurp, and bang. Hi, Cheryl. Welcome to another episode of Mighty Car Mods. In fact, a special episode all about ethanol-based fuel. Now, if you've got an eyeball, a car, and an internet connection, you would have seen it being used a lot. You would have seen it in a lot of Mighty Car Mods episodes. It's really gaining traction as a race fuel you can, you can buy at the pump. That's right. Now, we made crazy power, of course, with Super Gramps running E85, uh, plus our recent Mini, our supercharged classic Mini project. Miss Daisy. Miss Daisy, of course, and I mean, even the V8 supercars they're running on this race fuel. Why are they running on it? Who uses it? Why are they using it? How is it made, Martin? These are the questions that are flying around the interballs and we want to find the answers, don't we, Martin? So we're gonna go and speak to a couple of people who are quite smart, some people who know how to make it, some people who use it regularly, and, um, and try and find out a bit more. I'm wrapping this condom over my head, Martin, because I'm about to dive in deeper than I've ever been before, and you're coming with me. We're diving deeper down the ethanol wormhole than we've ever been before, and we don't know what's gonna be at the bottom of that wormhole. It could be some corn, it could be some wheat, it could be some sugar cane. There might be a dinosaur waiting down there. We don't know what's at the bottom of the wormhole, but we are about to find out in this very special Mighty Car Mods episode all about ethanol. To turn your car from a decorative combination of metal and plastic into a moving, boosting, skidding, lapping or cruising machine, you need fuel. Since cars were invented, we've had to burn things to make them move. Internal combustion engines won the race to the racetrack, and as we got better at refining petrol for higher energy content and more knock resistance, it became the choice for cars around the world. At first, petrol was a byproduct of making kerosene. It was seen as waste and it was burned off. With demand increasing by the day, two American inventors found a way to crack the heavier kerosene molecules into lighter molecules which doubled the yield. From there, others found a way to further improve resistance to detonation in engines with additives like lead and even ethanol. Petrol from crude oil became one of the world's most important resources. Dependence on foreign sources of oil became common. Wars were started and ended over it, as millions of extra cars drove out of factories and onto the roads every year, keeping the accelerator pedal of the industrial age pinned. In the 70s, petrol cleaned up its act when the health hazards became apparent. Oil shortages then had the world begin to look for alternate sources of fuel to burn. Energy independence became more important than ever, and ethanol was thrown back into the spotlight. Archaeologists have been digging up 9,000-year-old artefacts with traces of it, and 800 years ago, Greek and Arabs figured out distillation, which to this day is the way that we can turn organic matter into fuel we can burn. The Model T Ford was designed to run on petrol or ethanol, but with prohibition and cheap petrol available after World War II, petrol cemented itself as the fuel of choice around for most of the world. A notable exception being Brazil, where its massive sugarcane industry encouraged a fuel they could produce locally. In 1992, the Energy Policy Act begins in the USA. This government policy kickstarts an industry requiring automakers to produce cars that can run on 85% ethanol. Millions of new ethanol-compatible flex-fuel vehicles are produced, proving the influence government policy can have on the auto industry. However, the 85% blend can still be hard to find at the pump. Many countries have since followed suit, and the ethanol industry is slowly gaining momentum, proving it a viable alternative to non-renewable fossil fuels. So here we have premium unleaded, the kind that you can buy at most petrol pumps all around the country, in Australia anyway. And next to it we have ethanol, an E85 blend, which is 15% of this stuff, and then 85% ethanol. Now BTU, or British Thermal Units, is the standard way of measuring how much energy content is in each of these fuels. Now, premium unleaded, that's got around 111,000 BTU. Ethanol, you're looking at about 81,000. So it's a good third less, which makes sense why everyone keeps saying 30 to 40% more ethanol is required for the same energy as what's in this. So one of the most common questions that we see when it comes to ethanol, and specifically in Australia, E85, 
is why is it so hard to get? I mean, why can't you just get it everywhere, Martin? It's, it literally is supply and demand. I mean, like, there's a certain number of people that are using it. We think as car enthusiasts that everyone's a car enthusiast. It's not the case. I mean, you or your mates might have cars that go and fill up at the E85 pump, but for the other five days of the week, it might be very quiet. But it's yeah. a relatively small market, so it's a balance of how much do we put in that's actually gonna sell. Because at the end of the day, if they're not selling it and making money, they're not, it's not gonna be available. All right, so we're starting to answer some of these questions, but now let's talk about people who actually tune for this fuel, and we're gonna have a chat with Tuning Fork, who of course tuned Super Grants, which is Marty's uh, Liberty that was running 11 second quarter miles, and of course my classic supercharged Mini. Let's go down and say hello to Tuning Fork. We first met Scott, aka Tuning Fork, when we turboed the MX-5. His years of experience working for an aftermarket ECU manufacturer has had him involved in development, support, setup and testing. Since then he's had a hand in more than a few of our builds, including the original Gramps, Super Gramps, Miss Daisy and of course Moog's Mad Supercharged Mini. With the exception of the Mazda, every other car has had its final tune done on E85 and we saw significant power increases on the dyno and improved drivability on the road. Turbocharger technology has come such a long way now, so boost pressures that used to get running cars were 10, 15 pounds. Now the base tune realistically is low 20s up to 30, 40, 50 pounds that we're seeing in a lot of these engines is very reasonable now. Computers in general have changed, so the graphical interfaces that we use to tune cars now were a lot nicer, the data logging's a lot nicer, the quality of injectors, the quality of fuel pumps, uh, and the quality of the fuels. Dale from Castle Hill Performance has tuned thousands of cars, including his seven second Turbo V8 Commodore. And when we started, the only fuel you could get was 95 was premium unleaded and then yeah, they brought 98 in and now E85 and then yeah, racing fuels now. C16 is probably the most common that we were sort of mucking around with. Smells really nice. Um, it's a petrol based fuel but really high anti-knock index so you can make a huge amount of power out of it. You still get it, you still use it, some people still do use it. Um, yeah, it's very pure, very refined fuel and it makes a lot of power, but ethanol is, is a good thing. Ethanol based fuels now are, are where it's at. So even though you use more of it, it's cheaper, um, you get a much better cooling effect out of it. Um, methanol and ethanol based fuels, you obviously need a lot more of it. So ethanol fuels really roughly in your fuel system, you'll need somewhere about 40% more methanol based fuel or, or straight methanol like an M1 or an M5 based fuel 50-55% more fuel system in total but the effect that you get on the engine is just ginormous so because there's so much water in these fuels that the evaporation rate of those fuels at the temperatures that the air is going into our engine or our charge air temperature the, the evaporation rate is so huge that it cools down that charge so much that it increases the volumetric efficiency of our engines uh, and puts a huge safety barrier there. So when we are pushing them hard, it's very little chance of engine damage. Uh, when you're tuning for the 85, you can get a lot more aggressive on the tune. You can use a lot more ignition timing. Um, and obviously, because it's cooling inside the cylinders more, you can get away with a lot more. The tuning window is a lot wider. Uh, engine failure rates are generally a lot less on, on ethanol compared to pump fuel. For the aftermarket industry in Australia, I think it's excellent having it at the pump. It's, it's opened so many doors where there's so many manufacturers now that are doing really, really great work with pumps, injectors, engine management systems, uh, building engines that are more suited to this style of fuel. And the end user is the real winner because they get a cheap, sustainable fuel. It goes into the car, smells nice, makes really good power, it's been brilliant for the industry. It really has woken it up. Ethanol's good. Um, they ran our race car on ethanol for a long time. Uh, just trying to get that little bit more power. So yeah, street cars, yeah, ethanol's awesome. In the last five years, we've just seen the power numbers grow and grow and the reliability just get better and better. So it turns out fuel is not the only thing that ethanol is used in. It is all through your house, it's all through your work, it is everywhere. That's right, you'll find it in food products, in drink products, it's even in hand sanitizer. And chances are, right now, if you go and find some products in your house and you have a look at the label, 
you will find some ethanol on a lot of those products. So we want to dive even deeper into the wormhole and find out what is it, where is it made, where does it come from? Ethanol can be made from many things, but mostly it's made from things that are grown. In the USA, corn varieties make up a large proportion of ethanol production. In Brazil and Queensland and Australia, it's sugarcane. For us in New South Wales, it's wheat and sorghum. This farm is five hours west of Sydney. The dirt is red, but with irrigation and some smart farming, this farm will produce tonnes of raw material to make cattle feed and ethanol. The crop gets harvested, loaded into a truck and sent to a place just like this, the Manildra Processing Plant on the south coast of New South Wales. With its maze of metal piping, storage tanks, stainless steel, trucks and warning signs, it looks to have a lot in common with an ore refinery. But the materials brought here are all grown and can be regrown, making the resulting fuel a renewable biofuel. So we decided to follow the crops and see what's involved in extracting ethanol out of things grown in the dirt. Ethanol fuel is essentially a biofuel, which means it comes from plant or biomass derived sources. So in Australia what that means is we make it from wheat starch, so we process wheat and one of the byproducts from that we actually make the ethanol from. Uh, we also make it from sorghum, which is another grain, uh, grain product. It's not a food grain, it's a, it's a grain for animals. And we also make it from molasses, which is a byproduct of the sugar industry. Ethanol is actually essentially from the fermentation of glucose. So glucose you can source out of a sugar, or it can be made from a starch, or it can be made from cellulose. We're not doing that yet at the moment, but cellulose is basically a series of chains of glucose, which are also cross-linked. So it's got lots of bonds that you need to break to get back down to the glucose, but it's still possible. So the way you make it, is you break it down first into the glucose level, so you get that one glucose molecule. You then introduce some yeast. The yeast eats that, that glucose um, molecule and produces ethanol. So that ethanol first comes into in the form of a beer. So it's just like making beer at home. You know, you, you ferment your beer uh, uh, from, your, from your barley, um, you hop, and you hop it. Well, in this case, we take starch or we take a sugar and we ferment it with the yeast. Once we've got it from there, we then concentrate it up. First we take that beer and put it into what we call beer column. We add steam and we produce off that column about a 50% ethanol mixture. We then take it to a further column which is called rectifying column and we, we generate off the top of that column 96% ethanol. Now it's 96% because that last 4% is really sticky. And to get that rid of that, to make 100% alcohol, you actually need to put it through what's called a molecular sieve, which is like a big drum, which is filled up with all these little beads, which has got little small holes in it, which are big enough for the water to sit in, but the ethanol can't fit. So it works like a strainer, and you strain out that last little bit of ethanol, and that's how you make uh, fuel ethanol. This has got the, the, what they call the fusel oils, or other alcohols in it, um, and it's quite a, uh, uh, well, it's a different odour, pungent odour. So just give it a small whiff and you'll smell... If you're a Scotch drinker, you'll not... Scotch drinkers love it. If you're not a Scotch drinker yeah. and you're a vodka drinker, you will hate it. Yeah, That's it smells... What I found. It's People either totally love it or hate it. There's, there's no... There's usually not an indifference. Yep. And you could light that, couldn't you? Oh yeah, that's 100%. Can you put that's... that in your car though? Yeah, that's fuel alcohol. Yes. Really? Fuel alcohol. And your car will run? Yes. <laughs> now this is the... Uh, uh, beverage grade, mm -hmm. so it smells a lot. It's still at 96%, so it's it's a lot cleaner, but it'll be uh, you won't have that odor that I picked up. That should be hopefully pick up. Is it supposed to smell more like vodka? Yes, so it is cleaner. Yeah, it's so true. If, if we were to water that down to 40%, it would be vodka. That's what we sell as vodka. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's the tap at the end of the factory, a vodka tap. What, what was the brand? Vodka in was, one tap and brand? fuel in the other tap. That's brilliant. Uh, well, so this is the scotch. That, no, that's, that was the... Oh, no, that's the vodka. Yeah. That's the scotch. Yeah. Can you smell the difference? Yeah. So that's, what? remember, it's very concentrated. So it's very different. Wow. Okay. The question is, is whether no, you'd have... Uh, whether you yeah, could... Not of the fuel. Not of the fuel. So the drink that one. Don't, don't drink the fuel. This one? Yeah, Wait yeah. a second. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll spit it out. <laughs> so I can consume it. The one that's fuel. Yeah, you, can, you can just consume either. Which is the one just, that's petal? It'll just taste awful. <laughs> but that's the one that can run in your car? Yeah. 
Yes. Can yeah, I spit the, on the, the floor? reason we denature it, as I said to you before, is so people will not drink it. I probably should try it while I'm here though, no, right? you should not try it while you're here. Because they get... <laughs> no, I don't want you try it. Ah! Oh, thank you. I got the edge. But nice try. <laughs> oh, that was interesting. Science! This is called science. <laughs> oh! Is that right? <laughs> oh, mouth on fire! That was fuel grade too! <laughs> Ah, mouth on fire. That's what Supergrass runs on, dude. Oh wow, that's amazing. Will my taste bud ever grow back? You can smell sweat. So where else does this freshly distilled ethanol end up? Well, it goes into vodka, gin, cordial, soft drinks, vinegar, food colorings, glazes, licorice, hand sanitizer, tablets, antibiotics, antibacterial soaps, mouthwash, toothpaste, hairspray, deodorant, cough syrup, soft drinks, laundry detergent, inks, adhesives, and even perfumes. And then where is it all headed? Well, cellulosic ethanol means waste products can become a source of raw materials rather than crops grown specifically for this purpose. I just want to make a quick public service announcement. You are not supposed to drink ethanol fuel. 100% ethanol is a bad idea to drink anyway. Go to some bar and try and get the highest overproof booze you can get. It's not a good idea to drink that. So drinking super refined, chemically engineered ethanol, that's a really, really bad idea. Don't call your local ethanol plant and say, can I have some ethanol? Cause I want to drink it like Moog did. That was naughty. So let's just, let's just pretend that didn't happen. And, and get on to talking about cars that go fast. So fuel grade ethanol leaves the plant and is sent off to be blended by the various companies that retail the fuel to the market. It's then loaded into tankers and makes its way to the petrol pump where you'll often see modified cars filling up. The price varies, but it's usually considerably cheaper than 98 octane. We've seen up to a 45 cent price difference. Many of the cars manufactured due to government mandates can also fill up at these pumps too. Their ECUs will adjust the tune to suit the ethanol content. Cars made by American companies are heavily represented here from the influence of the US renewables policy. So why are jerry cans such a common sight at the 85 pumps? Short answer is, you have to use more of it. There's less energy content litre to litre versus 98 octane, but its knock threshold is higher, meaning if you can add compression and ignition timing to take advantage of this, you can make more power. And where will you find the highest concentration of people chasing more power in cars? At a racetrack. We're at the Bathurst race of the V8 supercars. It's a pilgrimage for racing fans and one of the most iconic and wildest races in Australia. In the 1960s, the Mini was king of Mount Panorama, and in the early 90s, Godzilla showed everyone who was boss. These days, the race cars have tightly controlled chassis, V8 engines from various manufacturers, and they run on E85 fuel. We caught up with Jason Bush, race engineer for Walkinshaw Racing, to find out more about his cars and what powers them. So each team can do their own engines, so as a holding team we use a GM block, Ford use a Ford block and each of the new manufacturers, Holden, Nissan and Mercedes have their own engines. So we have our own in-house engine department at Walkinshaw Racing using GM blocks. So um, our engine would be slightly different to our other Holden teams and it's unique to our four cars. Currently we use E85 which is 85% ethanol. Um, in the past we used a lot more petrol based fuel um, and as a result we use now by volume we use about 30% more fuel than we did say in 2009. Other than that it doesn't change the characteristics a great deal. To control fuel each team is given a given barrels as they require and every team has to use the same fuel so after qualifying today um, here at Bathurst we got our fuel checked and they check a few different markers, ethanol content, and they put a dye in there to make sure that every team upon inspection is shown to be using the correct fuel. This saves money for, you know, if it was an arms race, we'd be developing rocket fuel just to make the engines go faster. The biggest effect on performance probably is with the ethanol content, so it burns cleaner and it's better for the environment, but it does burn a lot more by volume. You know, we have an ECU map that controls the air-fuel ratio. We can't change the mapping mid-race, yeah. so it's sort of something you have to commit to at the start. So sometimes you have to commit to running full fat for the whole day, and then if you need to save fuel relying on the drivers to do it, 
So, or sometimes you might want to say run, cons you know, run a little bit leaner to eke out your fuel consumption. So, and in terms of fuel consumption, if the less fuel you use, it's not only being able to do a bigger stint like we saw at Bathurst last year, the less fuel you use, the less fuel you have to put in off the fuel rig here. So, the less time you're stationary in pit lane. So, the, the way we use the fuel is, can be controlled by our engine guys. Um, and our engine farm does a lot of tuning over the weekend and it can, it affects the power, but there are other considerations in terms of how hot the engine runs versus how much fuel and how much power and then how long we sit in pit lane for. So it's time to talk big picture for a second. Is ethanol actually clean? Well, there's lots of direct and indirect impacts. It depends what it's made from, how it's farmed, how it's stored, and even how much water is used in the process. Now, some scientists say that it's actually worse for the planet overall. The argument is that the emissions aren't much better than those produced from burning petrol, and that the energy required to make it in the first place outweighs the energy it actually creates. Emissions, a dirty word for a reason. It's often said that ethanol is cleaner burning, and studies show that it does release less of some of the toxic emissions found in petrol, but not all of them. You're burning something, it's going to make a mess. Crops grown for ethanol can compete with crops grown for food. Also true. What kind of an effect this has depends a lot on how the country's imports and exports are controlled, as well as their local markets. For example, sometimes ethanol production is actually a byproduct of creating cattle feed, something that humans can't eat anyway. But corn, on the other hand, well, we can eat that. And is there enough land to make both the fuel and the food? A lot of that depends on prices and how much the farmer's likely to get for that crop. Being made from a plant source is actually tied to that commodity. So as you look at wheat prices, as they go up and down, that's what impacts the, the cost of producing it. Same with sorghum, the same with sugar. Importantly for us car people, we also have to take a close look at what our cars are actually set up for. Modern cars, they're designed with ethanol in mind. Because if you look at uh, Europe and you look at the US, all of their vehicles are going to be subject to ethanol. All the major car manufacturers, they don't just make for Australia. We happen to be one of those markets. So all of the new cars that come through, all of those compatibility issues have been dealt with. The sorts of things you need to look for in older cars are things like um, some of the rubber compounds uh, are incompatible with ethanol. They can swell and hence release. So you need to have those sort of things checked if you're doing modification to an older type car. So some of the issues that you get that you've got to watch for is as, it, as you put it into a new car that hasn't run on uh, uh, ethanol before and it's been running on dirtier fossil fuels for longer, then you're going to be picking up this stuff and it'll start to, it'll get collected in your fuel filters. So you might need to change those um, early on. But uh, if you consistently run with ethanol, then you'll keep your, your engine uh, components clean. So is ethanol the silver bullet in solving the world's fuel problems? No. Will oil production stop anytime soon? No. Does ethanol fuel suit everyone and every car? No and no. But in the end, the decision lies with the consumer. Are you prepared to burn more of something in order to make more power? Does where your fuel come from matter to you? Grown and renewed or drilled out the bottom of the ocean, it's you who gets to decide what you burn. There has never been more fuel options available to us than there is today. Combustion engines have been a part of our lives for centuries and they'll remain in the picture until we find a way to create, store and use energy more efficiently. Government and environmental policies will continue to play a big part in how we fuel our cars. Regardless, technology is changing and we're getting better at extracting more energy from less material. We're making more efficient engines and we're more conscious of the environment than ever and the biggest influence, the market, is catching up. So is it just a boutique fuel or can it fuel the masses? Time will tell, but for us, the proof is in the performance, with many of our project cars making more power and going faster. Now, I don't know about you, but I found that incredibly edumacational. And for me, on a purely personal level, I've got my classic supercharged Mini. We put a flex fuel sensor in there, we plug a laptop in, we go flickety flickety flick, I put E85 in the tank, and the car goes faster. And to me, considering that's a renewable fuel, that is pretty freaking awesome. Now, if you want to lose three weeks of your life, get on there and start doing some research. The more you learn, 
the less you know, because there is just so much going on with this. There's politics, there's chemistry, there's mechanics, there's engineering, there's all this kind of cool stuff going on. But from a very basic level, to be able to go, what am I putting in my car and why does it make it go faster? Why is it turning into this thing? You know, why is it not available in places and how come people can just go and get a tune and suddenly make all this more power? There's so, there's so much to it, uh, but yeah. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Man. It is the tip of the iceberg, and you know what? I'm just I'm going to take it one step further from an aerial view and get my hippie on. You don't have to know all the answers, but having questions is actually really, really important. And it's not just ethanol fuel. You can start saying, where did my clothes come from? What's this food? What's this drink? What's this whatever? Start having a look and seeing where these things come from and educate yourself on what it is that you put in your body and in your car, what's going out into the world. That's my hippie bit done. I'm gonna go eat some tofu. I'm gonna power myself on tofu, which is a renewable source as far as I know. Uh, and um, there it is. Thank you so much for watching. MightyCarMods.com, Facebook.com forward slash MightyCarMods, ethanol video. Well done, Martin. Let's go, let's go have some, do some drag races in a safe and legal place.